Well, joining us today is Jeffrey Madison, the CEO, and Fabian Riedel, the CTO of Stark Resources. Thank you both very much for joining us today on Stockbox. How are you doing, first of all, Jeffrey? Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, we're doing great. Thanks. Um, thanks for having us on again. Um, we're looking forward to help to clarify some of the points uh, that have sort of been put out in the in the latest set of R and S's. A lot of the fears and concerns that the investor base has got, and really to answer some of the core questions is how is Prem doing? How is the project doing, etc. And we're here today to sort of put that out to the to to to, to the share base. Indeed, I understand you want to sort of set that record straight and also answer some questions that shareholders have. The last time we spoke, of course, was when we were live from Zulu, but it's nice to be catching up with you again in a different manner. And Fabian, how are you? Thank you very much. You're the Chief Technical Officer for Stark. Thank you for joining us as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be on the show and uh, okay. um, for people to hear from the horse's mouth, I guess. <clears throat> indeed, indeed. So talking about sort of setting the record straight here, and I want to talk first of all about the fast track approach versus the traditional DFS uh, approach and get some uh, questions from investors answered towards the end of the the, the, uh, the interview here. So I mean, most investors will be aware that Zulu was fast tracked, uh, which bypassed the need for a DFS. How was this decision taken, first of all, and why? I think, I think Mark, maybe, maybe to start off here, um... We would like to sort of frame or paint a picture of, of how we got here today. Um, obviously, a lot of time has passed, or, or, or relatively speaking, very little time, of course, in, in the development of a typical mining project. And, and between Fabian and myself today, we would like to highlight the approach, how we got here. And in particular, of course, by virtue of, of negating a full design feasibility study, the various risks and 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 considerations that one be, one needs to accept going into this sort of eyes wide open as one would say so um i guess over to you fabian yeah i mean the the decision was made early last year to uh, not engage in the dfs but to fast track it due to the market conditions and with that obviously accept some uh, some risks but uh, uh, still be able to be earlier in production than with a pr traditional approach. And that was, uh, uh, that's where we are. And we're still uh, much further and better on track than if we were <clears throat> and had engaged on a, uh, a DFS approach. And uh, yeah, we've prepared uh, like a one slider, uh, like a little overview, uh, what that, <clears throat> what the difference is here and what we're really talking about. Maybe. To visualize it is that possible <clears throat> yes let's bring in that slide then see if we can yeah. uh, get a better idea yeah so um the aggressive timeline that's what we uh, pursued in the beginning that's the, uh, the golden uh, line here where we make a lot of progress early on and then uh, um, uh, have a little bit longer optimization phase but still within everything within one year getting the plant into production the traditional approach with a, a DFS study where you really spend a lot of time studying all aspects of the deposit and implications on plant design in detail with a whole lot of test work just takes a lot of time. That's due to having to do testing, acquiring samples, doing testing at various uh, OEMs, yeah, original equipment manufacturers for part of the unit processes of the plant, all the way down to a uh, tailings facility and so on. And that takes at least uh, uh, one to one and a half years if you do it quickly. And only then you start with a detailed design of the plant. And that's a timeline that will bring you over two, two and a half years before you're in production. And that is where most of the competitors of Prem are at this stage, yes? <clears throat> they, uh, they are approaching it uh, in this way and uh, they are nowhere near anywhere where you would be in a, in a production environment. We have approached it aggressively, are now on a, let's say, normal uh, fast track timeline. That's the middle uh, uh, line here, where we are in a little bit longer optimization phase, but will still be much earlier, in pro finally in production than if we were or had engaged the DFS uh, 
So the benefits then, what are the main benefits to doing this fast track approach and bypassing the DFS? Aside from the obvious, you, you could in theory get into production earlier. Um, so it enables us, uh, the, the, the flexible modular plant layout enables optimization changes and upgrading of capacity and metallurgical uh, activities uh, throughout the design phase and even further during optimization and production phases. That's, uh, uh, and this not only has to do with uh, being in production earlier, but being able to adjust to the uh, uh, changing ore characteristics. So a, uh, a deposit, in this case, a lithium spodumene deposit is a natural uh, thing that's not homogeneous. And uh, it, you have to adjust for changes in it. And the layout of this plant and uh, uh, the way we approached it is ideally suited to um, react to changes <clears throat> in there. With a DFS, you would or you try to get into a position to foresee all of these changes that nature brings uh, uh, before you even start designing the plant. But even plants designed for years and years before they get built are, uh, uh, have certain flexibilities built into them for future changes in the ore body or unforeseeable uh, changes. And there are many, many plants out there where this actually has happened without anybody uh, uh, expecting it, where changes have to be made. So brownfields changes to plants, even down in the life of the plant, are normal. And we have taken this into account from the beginning and um, are seeing some of these changes uh, having to be made now uh, early on. <clears throat> Indeed. Okay. And why do you think it is that other mining companies don't go down this, this fast-tracked approach and go down the traditional DFS approach? Well, it's, uh, uh, at the moment, there's very unique market conditions that where we benefit from going through this fast track. Normally, mm -hmm. don't do it because uh, uh, you have to uh, convince uh, uh, investors yeah? uh, who want to um, <clears throat> uh, have everything planned out to the uh, nth degree. And right now, the uh, uh, upside for, for the market conditions are uh, uh, in favor of doing it in a fast track. Okay. Okay. I think maybe, Mark, to, to, to add on to that there is, I think that that's the core benefit that Prem and the, and the investor base sees, is Prem is capturing the, the, the market. Uh, Fabian has alluded to the competitor base, uh, Prem's competitor base, that, of course, are not as far down. There's many producers that are looking at, I mean, there were some announcements this morning around new uh, producers being online for DSO, uh, online for looking at uh, the execution of their projects in the coming year. I mean, together with the, the regional uh, governmental changes that are taking place in all of the various uh, uh, parts of the world, uh, particularly now in Africa, there's soon to be bans across multiple countries for DSO all. And Prem's fast track approach obviously de-risks that. So, I mean, Prem is producing a, a, a final concentrate, an SC6, that can then be sold off. So there's no risk of, of, of the project or the, or, or, or the plant uh, uh, being put under, uh, under that guise. And, of course, additionally to that, with having the process plant uh, on surface, uh, one is, of course, catching the market. And when the price correction uh, begins, and there will, of course, be a price correction, prices are already starting to soften. Uh, the other players that have been producing a DSO ore or those that are not yet into production will find their businesses in a far more troublesome space than what Prem will. So Prem is, of course, providing a certain security by virtue of having a higher upfront risk and, and moving across now into a, a space where there is a production facility that's standing on surface. They have got a project. The lithium is in the ground. They are de-risking uh, the, the business, of course, for the medium and long term. Okay. I wonder if you can just explain a little bit more about that, Jeffrey, that DSO and the comparison to other operators there. Because DSO means direct, direct shipping, doesn't it? So what, what's the difference in the model here? So the, the 
the DSO is is literally digging uh, uh, lithium from the ground uh, or a spodumene a spodumene type ore, and one would then ship it directly. And grades there are ranging anything from one percent to six percent. Um, I guess the typical DSO ore is somewhere between one point five and two point five percent. Two point five percent really being on the on the high side as an average. I know in Zimbabwe now they are, and I speak under correction, I, I believe the number is around 4% that one has to get their, their ore up to and above to allow it to be, ex to, to be exported. Please and of course, or 3%, sorry. And of course, Prem is looking at producing 5.5% plus or SC6. And that, of course, is then a, a final concentrate that would then go off to one of the hydroxide producers then. Okay, so it's producing the not the end product, but a more intermediate product of SC6 rather than straightforward Correct. processed ore. Okay, and when the lithium price corrects, as you as you allude to, that it, it might come off a little bit, then uh, some of the, these other producers will, will struggle, will they, you think? Absolutely. I mean, the okay. prices have softened. I mean, there was a significant softening of prices beginning sort of, I think, around December. Prices started to cool off significantly. I think at their peak, they were... At nearly seven thousand dollars for SC six, pricing then softened down to below. Uh, I think it was below four, and I'm I'm not sure where it's sitting now today. But prices are generally softening off, and it's it's normal, of course. There's it has to soften because the market, of course, cannot absorb these exceptionally mm -hmm. high prices. What the long term average is going to be, I don't know. One can of course speculate, but we see we we see from our research internally and from the research that's openly available in the public space a long term uh, mean which is well within the, the constraints of the business model that the prem has on 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 zulu so the further you can take something down that value chain that value curve the better really the further you can get to almost absolutely. providing the end product absolutely yes okay well, I just want to talk about some of the perhaps disadvantages maybe of the fast track approach versus the DFS. As I understand, if you go down a DFS route, a lot of studies will be done, a lot of testing will be done so you can optimize before you start to build. Whereas at the moment, you're currently optimizing on the fly, so to speak. And of course, that has led to some slight issues, I'm, I'm, I think, around the mill. Now, when I was on site, uh, that, that I, I recall that there was some maintenance going on, they were changing a bearing because there was some water ingress into the EDS mill there. Well, that was fixed very quickly within, I think, less than 24 hours, that was actually fixed and back up and running. But you're still having some slight issues here around the mill, are you? Can you allude to any of the challenges that you're currently facing with getting uh, to production and how you're addressing them? Yeah, that was the beginning where we saw that uh, <clears throat> that we cannot run it in this configuration steadily enough yeah, uh, to provide uh, so flotation plant that's downstream that's the core of the whole process that's the key to producing se6 out of this particular ore which is very finely uh, liberating and uh, <clears throat> so flotation is the key to produce uh, the, the product so the material needs to be liberated means milled down to uh, to a certain size and um, for that uh, uh, for that to work, or for a flotation plant to work, you need a steady feed for over a long time. Yeah, you you can't just switch it on and off like a crusher or a, a screen. Yeah, for example. And uh, so we started getting these uh, uh, issues on the mill, which affects the steady flow of material to the flotation plant. So it's a uh, it's uh, uh, it started to get a vicious circle and. Uh, we couldn't then <clears throat> stabilize the performance of the mill over long enough periods anymore, which was basically then the, uh, the, the cause for, the, uh, for declaring force majeure, because that was totally unforeseen and couldn't, uh, uh, was also not expected by, by the OEM and so on. So we're rectifying this at the moment. Uh, in addition to that, um, <clears throat> we have an issue with uh, moisture going back into the mill, which was also not uh, uh, expected that this would be an issue. And to uh, address this sizing issue in this circuit, we're installing a hydro sizer now. That is the equipment that should have been in several weeks ago already, but it's being held up at the border, uh, which uh, we didn't foresee. And just today, 
uh, the, the trucks are being released at the border and making their way to the mine. Okay. So we'll see the construction of that part of the plant uh, next week. Okay, so the hydro sizer has crossed the border and should be installed next week. So that should help reduce that water ingress into the mill there. But in terms of you actually saying there's a, almost a fundamental problem with getting the, the, uh, the ore crushed to the correct size as well. Yeah, correct. So uh, we could not close the circuit because of moist material going back to the mill. And uh, <clears throat> we've adjusted the sizing there. We'll make sure now that only dry uh, feed is going back into the mill and the, the wet material that will come from the hydrosizer will in the future have to be milled down uh, in the ball mill. So that's oh. the future, that's, gonna, that's phase two, yeah? that's uh, phase two of the optimization. Uh, the reason for our, that taking uh, to the uh, end of this year, beginning of next year, to have this um, <coughs> uh, ball mill installed to be able to treat the, the wet material. Okay, so just so I understand then, the EDS mill will be made a dry mill purely. The hydro sizer will take off the, the, the elements that are not the right size, put them aside temporarily until you get phase two to get the ball mill so you can crush those down to the correct size. Exactly. Okay, and that ball mill is phase two. When did you say, in, in, uh, uh, when did you say you'd hope to get that installed? Installed uh, before the end of the year, but then uh, until everything is operational running, that's going to be Q1. Q1, okay, well, that's operational. However, once the EDS mill is dry, you'll be able to get into a steady form of production. Exactly. Yeah. Do you know uh, at the moment you have a prediction as to what sort of uh, percentage-wise that will be of, uh, of the nameplate throughput? So that should be uh, in the 50% order. So that's at least the tonnage that we're going to send through, 50%. Uh, how much product we're going to get out at the end is obviously always a matter of uh, what grade you throw into the plant. And to deal with that and to, um, to uh, control that better, because ultimately it's important what we throw into the flotation or into the mill, yeah, so we already have uh, uh, XRT sorters in place. They take care of uh, external dilution, waste rock that's, uh, that's being mined. Uh, um, although the, they're mining relatively cleanly selectively at the moment. So that's actually very good grade control on that side. Uh, but these sorters take care of every little bit that's still uh, uh, coming the, the way through to the, to the primary crusher. And this helps the flotation plant a lot because these uh, contaminants that uh, um, are really uh, um, affecting the, the flotation negatively. Um, so they don't really upgrade a lot, but they take care of all these contaminants. Okay. Now the UV sorters that are going in next week or going, going to be installed next week, they really upgrade the material because they are uh, specifically targeting a spodumene. The mineral so we will see a much higher grade going into the mill so that's the grade control part of it and adding the hydrosizer will do uh, tonnage uh, stabilizing the tonnage uh, being able to go sent to the flotation okay uh, and then ultimately the tonnage uh, will be then secured with the with the ball mill to go to nameplate what uh, what the tonnage is concerned Indeed. Okay. Now, when these UV sorters are installed, would that also see the nameplate throughput rise from 50% up a little bit more or not? No, no, they will not take care of the, uh, the tonnage, only the grade. Yeah? It's the grade so really that you're going to get out. Okay. Yeah, and the grade you're targeting is, it's, is it 6% is it to get SC6? That's the final product. Uh, but the, the sorters are targeting the grade going into the mill. Yeah. Uh, and then the flotation takes care of the rest to get it through. Of the rest of it, okay. Okay, and you're confident with the installation of the UV sorters that you will get the grade required going into the mill to then get the, to be able to float SC6? Yes, Okay, no problem. Okay, well, just thinking on uh, some of these, this slight issue that perhaps impacts the, the overall timeline here. So you said they were unforeseen. So I have a, a couple of questions. First of all, why was it unforeseen? Um, that's the first one I want to ask you. But also, we're talking here 
perhaps another six months before you're going to get to nameplate throughput. So how was this not foreseen? And uh, can we speed up that timeline any quicker, do you think? So, Mark, perhaps one of the key, the key points here are the continued delays at the border crossing between South Africa and Zimbabwe. Uh, we currently have a significant impact, of course, due to the criticality of getting this new equipment as well as the UV sorters over the border. We've had now the, the recent uh, uh, set of trucks. Most of the trucks have been released. I believe there's still one truck that's standing at the border. But these, these delays are not new. I mean, we've had delays starting right from the beginning phases of this project. Stark received this order in, let's say, end of July, beginning of August of last year. And of course, we needed to order, construct, fabricate. One forgets, of course, there were major chip shortages. We had various challenges along the way, which we needed to deal with in real time. And then, of course, delays at the border further exacerbate the, the, the compression of the schedule that, the, that we look at, at putting out. Of course, Stark, Prem, and all parties involved are doing their best to obviously foresee and, and address this. But the current delay based on the latest RNS that was received, well, not the latest, the, the RNS where there was circa 1,300 uh, tons of spodumene to be produced, that is primarily related to the fact that the equipment has been standing at the border for over 14 days, the trucks have been standing. So um, once we, of course, have that equipment installed, one is obviously able to then start to, to, to get into production itself. Okay. And okay. the project schedule itself did not lend itself to having any buffer or, or contingency in terms of time or problem rectification due to the very compressed nature of of the project and all parties involved went into this eyes wide open of course fully understanding and of course we were pushing to of course uh, execute the project timelessly but as Lee, every week's of delay that you sit at the border is one week that you add onto the project of course so it's 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 sort of a one plus one uh, effect of course Okay, so it's a mixture of not perhaps foreseeing some of the problems with the mill, but then also problems at the border as well, getting the new equipment across. I think the mill, I think Fabian, perhaps you can talk to the mill itself because that's one of the core, the core issues, of course, that's, that's um, affecting us. Perhaps uh, before Fabian jumps in, there was a very conscious decision to go with the, the, the milling technology, the EDS mill, for its liberation profile, which of course is conducive to lower energies and so forth, mm -hmm. um, as well as the, the time frame and small footprint. Um, but Fabian, if you can perhaps talk to the technical issues around that. Yeah, I mean, the defects that we've encountered now, that was not foreseeable. That was uh, um, uh, also not by the uh, original equipment manufacturer, <coughs> um, because uh, in other configurations, these issues have not been seen, only now in this particular configuration. So that's something we have to deal with in real time. And the uh, OEM is really uh, going out of uh, their way to support us here and uh, to replace all the components that are uh, necessary to be replaced at their cost. So it's a complete warranty uh, case. And um, <clears throat> uh, we didn't even have to claim warranty uh, formally because it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that was not foreseen on that side. But unfortunately, it's really causing uh, delays. Um, on top of the, 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 the logistical uh, delays. Okay. And that's where we are right now. Plus the, the, the matter <clears throat> that we also only encountered when we started up the circuit, that the moisture content coming back into the mill is, uh, couldn't handle. And um, that led now to the, to the choice of uh, a milling the fines, the wet section with the wall mill. Mm. And but all of this combined, yeah, we were, we're still uh, in a much more favorable position as if we would have uh, gone the DFS route. Uh, if we would have gone that, we would still be doing studies and test work yeah, on all the various sections of the plant. Okay. And not only that, we would have uh, had to do much more sampling, more drilling and doing bulk sampling uh, um, to provide the uh, size of samples required for a DFS. Okay. So that sampling campaign alone would have taken us uh, probably half a year to get bulk samples out. And um, so all of this together, we are in a position where we understand the ore very well right now, yeah, what we're mining, because we have 
been putting uh, uh, thousands of tons through the plant already. And uh, that gives us a much better understanding than any DFS could have given us. And instead of now being in a position having to build and design a plant, we actually have got it standing there and we just need to do some optimizations. Mm -hmm. And by the time that is done in uh, half a year's time, uh, everybody, uh, we, we would have still taken at least another year uh, to build a plant from scratch with a DFS. Indeed. So, okay. um, and that is the value that is in this project and in this plant. Yeah? The deposit is there, the lithium and the spodumene is in the ground, not going anywhere. The, uh, the, the deposit has been drilled very well, uh, so it's well understood. The uh, plant is standing there. Metallurgically, we know all the issues now because we've run thousands of tons. And uh, the plant, all the capex is there, is put in the ground and it's ready to go. And that's uh, a very unique position in the market at the moment. <clears throat> okay, yes, that does explain that very well. Thank you, Fabian. I have a, a couple of questions before I go on to the shareholder questions. So we're talking really six months to be at nameplate throughput, but is that also potentially 125% of nameplate throughput as per the, the last RNS that uh, was relating to, to, this, to this matter? Yeah, so that's a matter of controlling the grade going into the plant, which whether UV sorters are key okay. of uh, uh, this uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, matter, yes. Okay, right. So nothing's changed in terms of the timeline since the last big RNS there relating to that. We are talking approximately six months to get to that 125%, but in theory, 50% within a couple of weeks. Yes. A couple of weeks, okay. Do you know if the plant is, still, is running uh, at the moment? Um, no, we stopped it uh, at the moment to wait for the hydro to be put in. Uh, there's okay. preparatory work being done, uh, uh, some okay. civil upgrades and so on. Okay, so that's coming next week. Okay. And just a final question on the, on the border issues. Is there anything you can do as a company to mitigate this as much as possible? I mean, I guess it's a, a big focus if that's a, quite a bit of a, a, a hiccup area. Um, I think, Mark, that's been done already. All the pre-clearing agents, documents, um, forward thinking, load consolidations, all the various things and initiatives. I mean, we've been doing projects in Africa directly and indirectly between Prem and Stark probably for the last 60 years. So we understand the logistical constraints and difficulties that, that one would see. And sometimes the loads go through quickly and sometimes the loads go through, um, mm. it, it, it takes longer. And we've seen, we've seen delays on the South African border as, as well as on, on the Zimbabwean border. And that's, related to all sorts of various reasons, which include things like public holidays, religious holidays, um, misinterpretation of, of documentation, errors on documents, of course, which, which I mean, all life, of course, is, is taking place. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, uh, equipment is flowing, of course, but when it comes to time critical uh, uh, equipment, like we see now, of course, with the hydro sizer, et cetera, and in particular, the UV sorters, of course, it it delays the project and every week that it stands is one week that you obviously off from the, the implementation and start up again, of course. Indeed. Okay. Well, thank you for that. If I can go on to some of the shareholder questions, unless there's anything else you, you wanted to add uh, there for me. No. Okay. Right then. Let, let, let's go. We have a, about 10 or so to get through. So the first question I have probably for you, Jeffrey, how many SC6 producing plants have start completed prior to Zulu? How much of the plant is experimental or unproven and were the risks clearly explained? Do Stark feel a sense of responsibility for some of the design failures at the, uh, and the losses for shareholders? Uh, Mark, we've, uh, Fabian and I've discussed here the, the various aspects and, and this, this question uh, uh, Fabian's going to be answering okay. uh, this morning. Yeah, I mean, um... In this configuration, that's the first plant uh, that we're building, but all the components and the modules uh, we've built before and our uh, partners and uh, sub suppliers have built before. So it's, <coughs> there is, uh, the experimental nature here is very limited. Yeah? Let's put it like that. The, the, the least uh, experience was on the mill itself, actually. Yeah? So uh, that was a conscious decision made between all parties here to go for this 
uh, due to lead time, footprint, energy efficiency, and metallurgical benefits. So these are, uh, were some very important decisions that had to be made um, to not go the conventional route uh, on this particular part of the plant. Um, so this is probably the one where the, the, the least experience was with, yes. And that's the one that we now have to uh, heavily modify. But um, uh, the original uh, 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 reasons for this decision still hold true. Yeah? It was really the lead time, the footprint, mm -hmm. because we have a, a modular plant here uh, that had to go in very quickly. We had, had no time to spare for conventional uh, uh, mm -hmm. circuit. And the metallurgical benefits. So this, uh, this type of uh, milling um, really uh, liberates the material selectively which has uh, big benefits uh, uh, in the flotation plant. So this is still true. And uh, if we were back at the same decision, same point with the same background, we probably would have uh, taken the same decision again. Okay, well, the next question I have is regarding the 125%, the, 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 uh, the full throughput, 25% over that, which would be 4,471, which I think was set out in a, a recent RNS. How confident are Stark that you can achieve that by the start of December? And if you can give that in percentage terms, I think this is what this person would like to know. Mm. Fabian? Yeah, I mean, uh, we are confident that we achieve the, the feed rate into the flotation. Yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's a normal 90, 95% confidence interval. Um, obviously, how much concentrate will come out then, that's a matter of uh, uh, the, the grade that is being fed in. So that's a matter of the mining uh, uh, schedule yeah, and the mineral resource management, the grade control, which is uh, uh, obviously outside of the plant operators and plant uh, builders control. So there I can't uh, comment uh, because we control or try to control that part, obviously, with the UV sorters. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, yes, we will set them up in a way that we get the highest grade into the plant and achieve that combined okay. with the feed rate that we're giving it. Okay. So um, <clears throat> to get it up to that nameplate capacity in terms of tonnage and feed rate, yes, we're 90, 95% confident that we'll achieve it. Okay, so you're ninety ninety five percent confident you'll achieve the throughput, but the grades, of course, and the final output, you're not sure of. I guess you can't speak at the moment, not from uh, Stark's point of view anyway, on the current grades that the plant is seeing. Yeah, correct. That's uh, because that's due and up to the mining uh, um, and the mine scheduling, where we have no sure. uh, influence over, and that's. Uh, but I mean, that's a typical thing. Yeah? Okay, that's a question. I think I maybe Mark to to. Maybe to add on to that, Mark, the, the plant configuration that we've got is fully capable to produce an SC6 concentrate. There's no question around that. It ties into the design considerations, the liberation factors and so forth, and all the various flexibility that we've have, we have in the plant. And there should be no question around that. And I think the questions around the deposit, the, uh, what Prem has drilled, et cetera, George is best placed to answer that. But what we do know, of course, is that there's been a significant amount of drilling and there's a good fundamental understanding uh, that will then, of course, tie into the release of a resource statement in the, in, in, in the future. Um, and okay. George is, of course, best placed to, to, to answer that. Indeed. Well, but in terms of the plant, um, uh, sorry, in terms of the plant and the, and the concerns around that, I think that there's been unnecessary concern around the performance related to the plant. There, we can, of course, say that we are fully confident that it is fit for purpose and uh, suitable for the application and the deposit. Okay. Well, that covers off another question I had. With, uh, will, the, uh, will the plant have the capabilities to achieve a grade of SC6? But you've clearly answered that. And that was also answered when I was on site as well. You have no concerns whatsoever. You will get to, to, that, to that product. Now, I just want to come on to some other questions that there is a little bit of, I think, frustration uh, from shareholders, particularly around Stark, perhaps. Um, so we have some questions here that if Stark do not fix these problems within the, the time frame set up, will they compensate Prem for the loss uh, of, of our partner and financial penalties that Prem are held for? I think maybe to answer that, we have, and I've stated this uh, before, 
We have a throughput guarantee, which we are, of course, already um, paying a penalty, of course, as part of, of our contribution to, to the rectification of, of the, the problems itself. Um, I cannot talk to Canmax and their strategies and, and their viewpoint on, on the project itself. All parties understood the risk going into it, and it's in no way one or, or, or multiple parties' faults. One has risk in projects, and of course, Spre uh, Stark is doing its utmost to, of course, resolve these as timelessly as possible. Um, and that's our statement on that question. Okay. Now, previously, did Stark commit to produce 1,376 tons of ST6 in June? How much has been produced so far? Um, Simple, simple uh, answer. We did commit to that. And due to the delays at the border and the okay. inability to, of course, implement the hydro sizes and associated equipment that we've uh, already discussed, we are, of course, not able to, to meet those targets. Okay. Okay. But that would be the plan for as soon as we Absolutely. get the equipment installed. Absolutely. Which is soon. All being well, the job is released soon. today, as exactly. you say. Okay. And we can start to show, I mean, we can start releasing some uh, some images around that, which I'm sure that we can go out in the prem boards, and we're looking at setting up a communications channel to provide a sort of more real-time feedback to the, to the, to the shareholder base sure. to help to improve the confidence levels. Okay, that, someone did ask me that as well, actually, so that's good that you're planning to set something like that up. Let's just get through a few of these last questions. Do Stark think that the plant failures encountered Justify Prem calling for the force majeure. Fabian? Yes, I mean, it was unforeseen defects uh, uh, on the particular on this uh, on the mill. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that's the reason for force majeure, correct? Okay. Uh, now then, the completed modifications, when will they be completed to have the plant fully operational? We've talked about that, haven't we? So that's the end of this year, really around six months time to be fully operational, but uh, getting to that 50% within a couple of weeks. Have any plans been drawn up to improve efficiency and output during 2024? Or is that not really the focus at the moment? Well, always not the core focus. Conceptual plans, yes, correct. Um, but uh, detailing these plans, we depend on the, <clears throat> the performance now and the monitoring of the uh, production in the coming months. Mm -hmm. And then we will uh, finalize uh, any further optimization. Definitely. Okay. okay. That's the whole okay. point of this uh, modular uh, and flexible plant. Indeed. Okay. Okay. I'm just looking through the last few questions here. I think we've covered a few uh, already in some previous answers. There's one here. Once the mine is fully operational, is Stark going to continue maintenance or will it be handed over to Prem? Has there been any talk of Stark building further plants uh, for other Prem projects? So um, uh, perhaps to answer um, on on that, I mean, we would hand the plant over to Prem to operate, but uh, Stark would remain as a technical and execution partner as part of the ongoing uh, operation and maintenance of the plant, as well as looking at the improvements that uh, we still don't know uh, could be improved as we gain more experience on the deposit itself. Um, and we would typically do that for all clients. It's, I mean, we are not a supplier of equipment. We are looking at providing a professional service that generates a product that a client can sell. And, of course, that ties into ultimately then equipment that would then be purchased. Mm. Um, in terms of talking about other projects with Prem, absolutely. We've got uh, multiple project initiatives on the Zulu project itself, um, including the addition of the discussed tantalum circuits, of course, uh, potential expansions. And we have many other projects where Prem is involved um, directly as, as, as Prem pro uh, projects or where Prem has shareholding in. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, we are, we're, we've been uh, training uh, site uh, staff throughout the commissioning phase. Yeah? That was part of that, completely uh, empowering the Zulu staff on site in operation and maintenance and uh, that's obviously key to sustainably operating the plant <clears throat> so these boxes have been ticked already okay fantastic well i think i'm on the last sort of there's a few questions that crossed over here um i'll kind of merge them into to one 
How did you uh, build the plant and then realize now we uh, six months later, you need these modifications? I guess we've covered that in the sense that it's not the typical DFS approach. It's part mm. of optimization. So I think that covers that. In terms of phase two, that's, of course, getting the, the, the hydrocyzer in place here, the, the bore mill as well. Are all these things easy fixes or could they lead to more problems? And is there a backup plan if the extra modifications aren't successful? Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> these modifications are relatively straightforward. Yeah? So that's uh, also not, we're not talking about any rocket science fixes, so it's very standard conventional uh, upgrades here. And uh, <clears throat> it's a matter of commissioning them and optimizing these unit processes, but that's also a standard uh, procedure. We will then obviously get a new mass balance uh, stabilized throughout the plant and uh, uh, learn from that going forward. But uh, yeah, the uh, effect on the plant is, uh, uh, the, the aim is to stabilize the the feed and production. Okay. Just a, a final uh, question here. Was any red flag raised for potential failure at the plant design uh, stage? Uh, did you have all the required information of the input material when you designed the plant uh, from Prem? Uh, and was it a fundamental design failure that's led to the delays? Well, we had uh, uh, all available information, obviously, was made available to us, uh, mm -hmm. but it was yet again. Uh, conscious decision not to go for DFS because then we would have uh, gathered the, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, further information, yeah, but at the expense of time yeah, and money, obviously. DFS would have cost a lot of money. Yeah, that, that would have been a couple of million dollars further plus uh, one, one and a half years later. And um, <clears throat> so that was consciously not done. So we knew that there was obviously uh, there were certain uh, parts of the puzzle uh, uh, not defined to the end, uh, end degree, um, <clears throat> which was and is being optimized at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'll just ask you both one final thought from myself. Of course, you, you as a company, you are presumably very aligned with Premium, wanting to see this as success, a big success story, of course. So your reputation is, is on the line, and of course, from Prem side, the investors uh, will be uh, upset if things don't happen. But I mean, how are you feeling given the current situation with the delays? It must be frustrating, but also with the recent news about Canmax wanting to basically now pull out of the deal, presumably because they are frustrated also with the delays. Are you concerned uh, and how confident are you that you will sort these issues out? So, Mark, perhaps perhaps to 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 segue into your question, uh, we've we've received a number of of requests uh, through d direct or instant messages. Uh, does Stark hold any prem stock or or, or or interest? And I would like to categorically state here that I mean it would be unethical for us, knowing what we know, to hold any prem stock and to look to leverage that position. So we do not directly or indirectly, nor do any employees of ours hold stock uh, that would be frowned upon. Um, we are fully confident that the project is going to work. We are fully committed to Prem. We've been together with uh, George and the Prem team for many, many years. The technical expertise of the Zulu team on site is, is exceptional. They have all the right experience and commitment. Our team is fully committed to the execution of the project. And there's no question in our minds that the project is going to be resolved and it's going to be producing at nameplate consistently and that the company is going to to turn into a producing uh, organization of SC6 concentrates that could then be extended and expanded well above the 50,000 tons that's been put out um, as part of the start of this project and put them onto the world stage as a producer of or a sustainable producer of, of lithium concentrates with the approach that we're looking at by removal of wastes, energy uh, reductions, etc. Okay, well, that's quite a confident statement. Are you concerned at all, Jeffrey, with the recent situation with Canmax? I've answered the question to many, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I'll answer it in the same way. Canmax is not the only uh, off taker of spodumene concentrate on the planet. There are many, many, many organizations that are after a SC6 concentrate. 
and I have no I have no doubt that that George is going to be able to find a um, an off take partner. There's some, just simply no question. And to further add, the CanMax agreement was a prepayment, of course. So the key thing here is that Prem still remains 100% debt unencumbered. Of course, there are certain responsibilities against the CanMax agreement, and we hope to see them uh, rectified. But of course, Prem still has a, a balance sheet which is debt free, and they are still a 100% owner of the project. So I don't view this as anything other than a a difficult time that one needs to, of course, uh, uh, overcome. Thank you both very much for your time today, Jeffrey Madison, the CEO of Stark Resources, and Fabian Riedel, the CTO. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Thank you for having us, Mark. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like, or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching. Thank you.